The FBI in Cincinnati had advised Kevin Hallinan, the chief of security of baseball, that they had a witness who they were going to prosecute and who had been cooperating with them, who had served as a middleman for Pete in running bets. His name was Paul Jansen. And um, Jansen claimed that Pete had not only bet on the game, but also bet on the Cincinnati Reds, and that they had evidence of that fact. We verified it very quickly. We talked to Jansen. He gave us the betting slips, which we determined very rapidly that were in Pete's handwriting. And on those betting slips, it indicates a wager on a Montreal-Cincinnati game that I believe uh, Cincinnati won, but it was one of a number of bets that beat it, placed through Jansen, and Jansen had called into the bookie. We verified it with the telephone records, etc. All were bet on Cincinnati winning, except when Mario Soto pitched for the Reds. And in that case, Pete would not bet on the Reds. We didn't have any difficulty. We just wanted to do it with great care and as fast as we could because it was a cloud on the game. The, the nature of the game itself um, uh, gets clouded when you have such a significant allegation out there against a, a man as accomplished as Pete Rose was in the game. So there were those, those were the factors that guided us and, and so forth. But I, uh, but I knew by the middle of March that uh, he was dead in the water in terms of the evidence. And I showed it to his lawyers before we ever put pen to paper. We let him listen to the tape recordings, we let him see the documents, we let him run through all the interviews with him, et cetera. And then we indicated we wanted to talk to Pete. And uh, we would show him. It was Bart's idea that we wouldn't do a traditional examination of Pete where we confront him, but we would do an examination where he was shown the evidence and permitted to explain if he chose. He, he could choose to just say nothing. So the two-day interview was a little bit unusual, but it didn't trouble me because it, I thought it was sort of a nifty idea by Bart. Let's give Pete and his lawyers a full look at everything and he can say whatever he wants. We'll have a court reporter present. And, uh, and we did. And when he saw the key pieces of evidence, he was not a well man. I mean, he reacted physically to the, to the, he had no idea we had the betting slips. He reacted when we played the tapes for him, of conversations between his various middlemen, talking about his betting activity and his debts to organized crime in New York. So. It was an uncomfortable time, but he was a gentleman the whole time, and we were gentlemen. But it was to give him a full opportunity before anything happened, before anybody knew about it, just so that uh, you know he, he could uh, he could make uh, an appropriate decision as to how he wanted to handle it. And so, unfortunately, they chose that they to sue the commissioner, which breached his own contract, and we had to have it out in the courts, but. Uh, it's not unusual when someone's in trouble. I had just wished that he had sort of faced up to it and dealt with it honestly because he had a great commissioner and a great deputy commissioner who would have treated him quite fairly. I think he would have sat down for a while and reconfigured his life. And we wouldn't be here today. So, you know, in my judgment, it's a great, it's a great tragedy. There's a lot of sadness, but... Um, as far as doing our job, you know, we, we talked to over 100 people that weren't even in the game of baseball who gave us significant information about his activities, and we presented all that to his lawyers many times. And they, they, had, they were unable to, to contradict it or change it in any way. So um, it is a powerful case. It is probably the most powerful case I think I've ever put together. He deny it or play, I don't recall, or I don't know anything about this, etc. Uh, but he, he was, 
clearly upset and, and troubled by it. I mean, he was, he, he just had great difficulty handling it. He was in great pain. He was obviously tortured by it. I mean, you can see when people are very uncomfortable, they change color. I mean, his color changed. He was just very, very uncomfortable. I mean, it was, it's nothing I take any pleasure in. It was, that's what happens when you're presented with your own handwriting and your own work and and the testimony of all your own friends and your own phone records. I mean, it's just, it was just endless, the amount of evidence presented to Pete. There are some, but in those we were extremely careful, like Peter's the bookmaker, to be able to corroborate with him. And he had authentic records that we could establish who wrote them, when they were written, etc. They corroborated everything he said. We had the phone records. If you go through the phone records for that period that we present in the report, um, we had a little verse that said, you know, night or day, home and away, those phone calls were made to the middleman, to the bookie, right out of the right out of the dugout or the manager's office, wherever he was, just like clockwork. He would place the bet, and they'd come back and confirm it. And after the game, he'd get on the phone again. So, you know, someone suggested that they were calling out for pizza. Well, I, I tell you that, you know, the bookmakers were not delivering pizza. So we had the records of the Cincinnati Reds organization and all the other ball clubs. We had his hotel records, we had the cell phone records, we had the middleman records, and we just lined them up. And you can just see it. it's absolutely overwhelming what he was doing every single night. And then you watch his bank account and you watch the money disappear. Then you listen to the tapes of the middlemen talking amongst each other on how bad it is and how much he's losing and how much he owes the wise guys in New York. And it all becomes a very clear picture. So the people who, in my experience, who don't want to accept it have not read the report. We've had a lot of sports writers and other people come to us and say, you know, this is a lot of baloney. Well, they didn't read the newspapers at the time, so we just send them a copy of the report. Every time they read it, they say, oh, oh, and then they see how compelling it is. But if people are in denial, I, I can't help them. But those, those are what the facts are. And I think it is what they ought to ask Pete, those who believe in him, is, Pete, where's your evidence? What's your response? Why didn't your lawyers examine the 113 witnesses Mr. Dowd made available? Pete, how do you explain your handwriting of the bet on the Cincinnati Montreal game? Pete, what is your thumbprint doing on that document? We have the original document. Pete, these are, this is a taped conversation between Paul Jansen and, and, uh, and Mikey Bertolini. It goes on for hours. Now, these are guys that lived with you. These guys that made money with you at the time. That's when the conversation took place, during that time. It was contemporaneous with all the betting. How do you explain that? Are they all smoking dope and they don't know what they're talking about? But well, we can corroborate every single bit of it, and we did it inside of 45 days. If I had had another six months, I'd have gotten out the tapes of the ball games, and I think I would have shown you some stuff. But... We didn't, we didn't have time.